and welcome back to my channel. Um, thank you all for your comments. Like I said, I will do a comments video at some point, but I just got one other article to get through um, in the meantime, and then I'll try and do a comments video. Um, the article I want to discuss is um, an article by Simon Baron Cohen called the concept of neurodiversity is dividing the autism community. This is Simon Van Cohen and it was written in 2019, scientificamerican.com. Now Simon Van Cohen is quite a controversial figure. And that some of the things he says are a bit controversial. Um, I agree with him on some areas and in other areas I don't really agree with him. So I do think he says some things that make sense and then he says other things I don't agree with. It's a bit of a mixed bag. Um, I agree with him on the idea of like um, his idea of empathy and um, how autistics tend to like systematise more and stuff like that. I agree with him there because I feel that's quite relevant to my own experience. And nowadays I sort of feel like the NDM is creating this whole new myth about autistic people being great at empathy and stuff like that, and uh, and they're not quite understanding the kind of nuances involved in the term and, and they're confusing categories. And that's a whole other topic. Um, like they seem to equate, they seem to think that em they seem to think that difficulties of empathy mean you don't care or you don't have compassion or you don't sympathise when they're completely different things. Like you can struggle with empathy and be the most caring, compassionate, sympathetic person. Empathy is not is a completely different category. Anyway, but I agree with Simon Van Cohen when he talks about that. But then in other areas like his extreme male brain theory and stuff like that, I don't really agree with him. But anyway, back to this article. So Simon so Simon Van Cohen begins by saying that by saying that some argue that severe challenges that the severe challenges faced by some autistic people fit better within a medical model. For example, there are autistics who struggle substantially in any environment and will always struggle in any environment, regardless of adaptions. There's, um, so for example, there is this neurodiversity quote that says, put, put us in fresh water and we function just fine. Put us in salt water and we struggle to survive. There's a kind of um, metaphor for this idea that the person, the person needs to fit with their environment and if they fit with their environment, then their disability is removed. Because the neurodiversity movement likes to draw a distinction between impairment and disability. The idea being that impairment is the innate... Um, difficulty that the person say experiences that is sort of embodied that is physical and that you're you sort of have as you sort of carry with you like the impairment is rooted in a person but then they have but then they separate that out from disability which is said to be um society said to be the sort of um exclusion a person experiences as a consequence of that impairment and they argue that that disability is created by society and that if society, say for example, I don't know, puts in place a ramp, for example, that's an example used by those, for those who have physical disabilities, they might put down a ramp for someone who needs to use a wheelchair. The idea is that the person will still have an impairment, like they can't walk, but that their disability will then be removed, sort of thing. Of course, some people in the neurodiversity movement would even question the whole idea of impairment, don't they? you know, the sort of hardcore section will even argue that impairment isn't a thing. Um, but there are a number in the neurodiversity movement who's, who will accept that um, they are disabled or whatever, but will say it's 100% caused by society and that if society were to change, then all the disability would go away. I personally think that's incredibly naive and simplistic and that would clearly only apply to those who are minimally impaired in the first place. Um, and... Yeah, and then the question would arise, well, are they really autistic then, if you can just magically do that? But um, but clearly they would have to only have a very small degree of impairment for that to be possible. Like, very mild, if that's the case. Um, but I, I, I sort of feel this distinction between impairment and disability, and disability, or the idea of disability being a, a social thing and impairment being a medical thing, I guess you could call that like a medical social synthesis in that case. I feel 
Yes, I do that disability is 100% a social phenomenon, it's very naive, and disability is quite connected to, to impairment. I, I don't think you can separate from out quite so much like that. Like, I, I sort of feel that, yes, disability is a consequence of impairment, impairment creates disability, but to say that disability is 100% social um, is just very naive. Like, I feel that for many people, no matter what society you live in, they're always going to be disabled. Um, and and also, like, they use the example of a person in a ramp, like a physical disability, which, of course, is way different to autism because, you know, autism is multifaceted and way more complex than that. But... Even, like, say someone in, like, say someone's got a physical disability yeah, and you provide them with a ramp, obviously then they can access an environment they wouldn't otherwise be able to access, so you could argue their disability has gone, but I, but they're still in a wheelchair, like, they still, um, you know, that still, like, sets them apart from other people, so they're still disabled, even though they, they, they might be less disabled than it would have been if that ramp wasn't there, but they're still disabled, like, you can't, you know, and say for sake of argument, like an autistic person who needs, like, support and stuff, like, loads and loads of support to function, and even with that support, still can't make meaningful relationships, even though they might really want those relationships, or, like, um, you know, really struggles to access certain environments that can never, can never be completely adapted to make them 100% okay. They're always going to be disabled, no matter what society you have. So I'm not arguing that disability isn't doesn't have a social element. Of course it does, but it also it was, it, but it's not it's never completely social. And I think that is where they're just incredibly naive. It's it's a multifaceted thing. Disability is never completely social, is it? Let's come on. I mean, you'd have to be incredibly mild for it to be completely social. I mean, if it is completely social, then good for you. But most people have have far more problems and. It just cannot be completely resolved by society. That's just way too, way too naive to think that. So yes, yeah, so Simon Van Cohen does talk a little bit about that. And he, as I say, he argues that for some, they have such severe challenges that um, the medical model is a better fit because they will struggle substantially in any environment, and I agree with him. I, I feel, though, yeah, that although the medical model might be a better fit for those people, and I'll say that actually for someone like me, the medical model is probably a better fit, I would say that that doesn't mean I negate the social model. That doesn't mean that um, I don't think the social model is relevant. If the social model is relevant, like, there are certain things that can be done that will make my life a lot easier. There are certain adaptions that I need that will make my life a lot easier. Um, and that's the social model. I'm not negating the social model. The social model is important. I'm simply saying that, it, that there is room for the medical model as well. <laughs> Um, and then I also, uh, my own personal uh, note to this is that if a neurodiversity movement says that everyone is neurodiverse, then neurotypical is redundant. Because the neurodiversity movement says everyone is neurodiverse, don't they? Which is true, that's a fact. Everyone is neurodiverse. There's no such thing as a, as, um, a typical brain. Everyone's got different brain. No brain is the same based upon genetics, environment, every single brain is different. It's like it's almost like a fingerprint. No one's brain is the same. So every single person's brain is different. So neurodiversity is a fact. It affects everyone. Everyone is neurodiverse. That's and that's what the neurodiversity movement says and that's a fact. You know, we can't argue with them. That's a fact. That is just a fact, you know? Um so if that is the case, like I say, again neurotypical is a redundant term. There's no such thing as neurotypical. So by the neurodiversity movement's own admission, neurotypicality doesn't exist. And yet, the neurodiversity movement keeps on going on about neurotypicality. So it basically contradicts itself. Figure that one out. If everyone's neurodiverse, there's no such thing as neurotypical. I mean, it's basically a logical fallacy to claim otherwise. How can everyone be neurodiverse and there's something called neurotypical? That would basically... Um, it doesn't add up, okay? So it's logically fallacious to say that. You can't say one thing and then say the next thing. It doesn't compute, does it? Because <laughs> for it to be neurotypical, right, um, you'd have to have um, some sort of brain that is standard, and there's no such thing as a standard brain. So if that's the case, so as they say, no brain is normal and all are simply different, um,
Yeah, as I say, no brand is normal and all are simply different. Um, but I would say, yeah, neurodiversity is a thing and everyone is neurodiverse, but then, um, there, but again, there are also brains that are so far removed from the usual level of diversity that actually you need to have conditions and diagnoses and disorders ascribed to them. Um, because otherwise, um, if everyone is treated the same, when some people... I mean, people shouldn't be treated the same ev anyway because everyone is different. But what I'm trying to say is, is that some people are so far removed from that usual one of the mill diversity that you need to... Um, you need to ascribe diagnoses to them and you need to basically separate it out from that one of the mill diversity because if you're just saying that it's the same type of diversity then you can't really expect anyone to take it seriously um you know you can't expect adaptions if you just say oh it's just what normal diversity well then people are like well why do you need anything extra special then why can't you just accept what we're giving to everyone else you know just normal difference because it's beyond that normal difference then you do need to start thinking, actually, saying, actually, this is a serious thing, this is a disorder, this is a diagnosis, because otherwise don't expect anyone to take it seriously. And the problem with the neurodiversity movement is that they're basically, by treating autism as just, like, part of natural variation, they're basically giving, they're basically enabling people not to take it seriously. And, and I don't think that's their intention, but unfortunately that is what happens. Okay, so I'm going to move over to video number two now.